Um, I'd like to welcome everyone tonight to um, this conversation between Gajin Fujita and Alona Katsu, and I will begin with um, saying a few words about the two participants. Uh, I'll begin with Gajin, whom I've known the longest. Uh, Gajin was born and raised in East Los Angeles. Uh, he studied at Otis College of Art and Design and then went on to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, where he studied with Dave Hickey. Uh, we got to know him around that time, um, actually began working with Gajin around 2001, including him in our first Rogue Wave exhibition. And immediately thereafter, we chose to represent him. And we've actually had three exhibitions of Gajin's paintings, um, primarily paintings, I should say. They have included some of his drawings, but in fact, this is the first exhibition that has entirely focused on Gajin's works on paper. Um, I'm going to read some of this because Gajin actually has quite a distinguished exhibition history. He has had solo shows at the Kemper Museum in Kansas in 2006, um, also at the Pacific Asia Museum in Pasadena in 2012, and perhaps most notably in 2005, he was the subject of a two-person exhibition at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art um, called Contemporary Projects 9, Gajin Fujita and Pablo Vargas Lugo, curated by Ilona Katsu. Um, that was actually the first time that Gajin's drawings were seen um, in public. And um, the genesis, I think, of this show began with that exhibition. Um, Beyond that, Gajin um, also has been included in a wide variety of museum group shows as various as Site Santa Fe um, in 2001, the Weatherspoon Art Museum in North Carolina, Prospect One in 2008, curated by Dan Cameron, now at the Orange County Museum, of course, um, the Minneapolis Art Museum, the Ringling Museum in Sarasota, to the Belvedere in Vienna, um, Outlook International in Athens, Greece, um, the Museum Morbjörs in Leverskusen, Germany, probably really messed that one up, and the Stedelijk Museum in Ghent, Belgium. As varied as these geographic locations, the subject of these shows have included the graphic impact of Japanese woodblock prints, the influence of hip-hop culture, plastic culture, pop culture, and even the subject of gold. Um, and in fact, right now, Gajin is also included at the Chinese American Museum in an exhibition that focus, focuses on mouth-altering condiments um, called LA Heat. Um, so that's a little bit about Gajin. Um, I'm going to now say a little bit about Ilona Katsu, who will lead the conversation tonight. As I mentioned, Ilona um, first entered Gajin's life um, in advance of the show that she did in 2005. Um, Ilona is uh, the curator and also the head of the Latin American department at the LA County Museum of Art. Uh, she received her PhD in 2000 from the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University. She has received numerous uh, scholarly fellowships, including a Fulbright, one from um, the Getty, from the um, Metropolitan Museum from the Ford Foundation and from the John Carter Brown. Um, and in 2011, she was named as the person to watch in the LA art world by the Los Angeles Times. Um, she has published widely in her field of expertise and has received awards for her books. In 2009, Stanford University Press published Race and Classification, The Case of Mexican America, and in 2011, LACMA and Yale University Press published Contestant Visions in the Spanish Colonial World. I should add that um, Ilona's main area of expertise is um, not only Latin American art, but the full breadth from colonial to contemporary. Uh, she's also trained as a modernist as well, so it's an extremely broad field. Um, a particular relevance to us, of course, is that uh, Ilona was the curator of Gagin's show. Um, but right now, her focus is um, working towards an exhibition of uh, 18th century Mexican painting and also um, the history of Latin American design. So I'm going to ask you, Ilona, to cast your mind back almost nine years 
to your show with Gajin and uh, begin the evening by talking about perhaps uh, that exhibition. So I will keep quiet now and just ask you to all to join me in a warm welcome for Gajin Fujita and Ilona Katsu. Well, first of all, it's an enormous pleasure to be at the LA Louvre Gallery. It's a gallery that I've watched and loved over the years, and I could not be happier and more grateful to be here uh, with Gajin, who... Well, thank you. <laughs> this, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is sort of a deja vu from 2005, six, right? Which is when we first met. Right, right. And uh, it was... Um, Gosh, that was a really interesting project because uh, we, back then, we had a series of contemporary projects at the LA County Museum of Art, which were called contemporary art projects. Things have evolved and developed enormously uh, in the past six years, but that was, uh, I had the opportunity to do a show on a contemporary artist, and I remember visiting the Fisher Gallery. I think it was uh, USC, there was a group show. And I saw one of your paintings in the gallery. Really? That just... I don't recall, but... <laughs> <laughs> but it was... Uh, out of the entire show, I remember this very well, because it was, a, it was a really wonderful painting that was sort of crazy. Because I just thought, my God, this is so incredibly precious. And uh, you, there was like the gold leaf and this really, really carefully drawn figures that I could immediately pick that they were out of uh, Ido, uh, Japanese woodblock block prints. And then I got closer and I started seeing all this graffiti. Yeah. So, <laughs> so like, what's going on here? And, uh, and, and I think that's one of the most amazing things about your work, Gajin, that you so embody LA and the sort of the coming together of cultures. So, so can, you, can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing and what, how you arrived to this solutions, this aesthetic solutions? Well, first of all, when, um, what was it, like 2005, when you had approached me and called me, I wasn't sure if this was a serious thing. I, <laughs> <laughs> I never got a call from LACMA. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I was kind of questioning you. <laughs> and had you come over to my house a couple of times and, you know, to see if you were uh, legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, it turned out to be a, a, a great project and um, thank you for uh, seeking me out in, in 2005. Um, the works... Um, what did you ask me? <laughs> um, the, I guess we can, draw, we can start talking about paintings first. Um, I guess that's what you were attracted to first. And so, yeah, the, the paintings were um, developed throughout my schooling at uh, Otis as well as uh, UNLV, and they, they came into fruition um, later on in my graduate studies out in Las Vegas um, with Dave Hickey. And um, these paintings that I make today um, all came about because Dave had one day in his lecture in class had told us that a painting um, ought to violate people's expectations and that was the the start of my mind racing to kind of conjure up what would violate people's expectations and so I thought with my graffiti background and um, my Japanese heritage, um, the melding of the two would possibly violate people's expectations. And about 
late 98, about um, October, is when I first made uh, a piece called Motel. And it was out of fake gold leaf. And uh, it had imaged a, an erotic scene, um, an erotic woodblock print, to, to be more specific. And that was what uh, caught the attention of a lot of people. That was like my prototype. And from there on, it was just sky's the limit. It was really the erotic topic. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Can you, Gajin, can you tell us a little bit more about the, um, I mean, one of the things that really shocked me driving to your house the first time was, uh, and being sort of a newbie to LA back then, it's like, wow, he's smack in the middle of Boyle Heights. So you pretty much grew up in East LA. How, how was that interface of cultures with, uh, and, and can you tell, and you were part of a crew too, a graffiti crew. Right. Um, you know, I was uh, raised in Boyle Heights and as well born there, but I think, um, you know, when I started to leave Boyle Heights, like in my uh, junior high years and kind of venture out into the west side, um, that I think really made me aware of the, the diversity of what L.A. Um, has, and it's a huge sprawl. Um, you know, uh, during my elementary school, yeah, I, I, I went to public school and the local schools, and so, yeah, I, I was immersed with graffiti. Um, it was the more, um, the gang culture, uh, there was lots of um, gang activity back in the early 80s and mid 80s up until the 90s. Um, but, you know, uh, I think the pervasiveness of LA and being that it's a huge sprawl, it, it really opened my eyes when I started to um, venture out of Boyle Heights and, um, you know, receive education from uh, a magnet school during junior high school. And then for high school, I went to Fairfax High, which is like a, a total opposite of being in Boyle Heights. You know, um, it's an old Jewish community. So, um, you know, the, I think unconsciously uh, that had to do with a lot of what um, gave me these creative ideas um, uh, to put down on my paintings. Yeah, this, uh, it's this kind of cross currents of different things that really, I mean, I think it attracted me enormously to your work initially and uh, all your followers too. I think it's that, it's, it's so, LA in many ways, but also one of the most remarkable things in my, my opinion too is the, the intricacy of your technique too. The, the works are very painstakingly, painstakingly constructed and um, I think that's something that a lot of your, your, your audience really enjoys seeing and, and appreciating. So. It would be wonderful if you could tell us a little bit more about how that happened, perhaps first in your painting process, so we can have a better understanding of this, uh, how it impacts the drawings, which uh, you're, you're all enveloped by this incredible selection of drawings, and it will give us a better understanding. Right. Um, I think I've been blessed and fortunate that I had touched upon the woodblock prints from like the Edo period in my you know, from Japan, um, it, it's just an infinitesimal um, amount of resource that I've got to work with. And um, from there, you know, studying the woodblock prints, um, you know, they make me look like a kindergartner um, if you were to see what they go through uh, in the intricacies and the details that they put in their prints. Um, so, you know, uh, 
trying to even like get close to what they do um, and their mastery um, gave me the the inspiration and the motivation to to strive for something that even comes close to what they do and um, you know that this, these are the results of what you see uh, of my attempt to uh, master uh, what they do and I think it goes hand in hand um, uh, people can see right away when they see these stencils that uh, it kind of mirrors um, the woodblock prints or the process of how the woodblock prints are made because you know the woodblock prints it can take up to 20 25 wood block prints or wood blocks to print a one image and it's sort of the similar process that I follow with just paper and um, the cutting of and stenciling of these papers uh, so I think it was really um, an inspiration from the wood block print artists um, you know and you know to name a few there's the famous Hokusai, Yoshitoshi, um, Kuniyoshi, and I also studied and researched a lot of um, tattoos um, because the tattoo artists in Japan they really look at and reference um, the artists that I had just mentioned from the woodblock print. And in terms of the paintings, just trying to get back at that a little bit. Um, you incorporate a lot of graffiti into those works as well. How, yeah. how does the process really work? Well, you know, by back when I was at uh, grad school, and even at Otis, I was uh, always trying to incorporate the graffiti because that was my background, I, I was kind of, that's what I started off with. It was painting out in the streets and, and um, hanging out with the crew and uh, doing pieces in yards and whatnot. Um, and that was like mid 80s, late 80s. And, you know, it was uh, early 90s when I took myself to, to school finally, and got serious about fine art. And um, so the graffiti has always been like a natural thing that has uh, been with me. And, you know, while I was at school, I was trying to figure out a way where, you know, where graffiti can be legitimate or be looked at as fine art, the mark making. Um, because it was it was shunned basically from the high so-called high art, and um, it was my way of trying to uniquely meld it, fuse it with um, the the uh, woodblock prints. But so you know, um, it is my primary process in my paintings. Um, and sometimes I um, call upon my friends to kind of uh, tag up the gold leaf gilded panels that I have made and to kind of get a more authentic feel of the street. Um, when, you ha when, you, well, when I see the, when there's layers of graffiti and tags and, and um, kind of spray paint marks, mark makings layered upon each other, that really resembles the streets to me. And that's kind of the reason why I've asked my crew members, my friends, to um, tag on the, the pieces. And I think it really worked. I think people are very intrigued by the fact that there are uh, numerous hands involved in um, the creation of the, of the background, or the so-called background. Yeah, well, it's kind of amazing because you prime the canvas with gesso, 
then you work very hard at sort of gilding it. Yeah. And then yeah. after that, you invite your friends to tag the gilded panel, right? Right. And, um, <laughs> you know... It's kind of crazy. I've, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, 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 you know, some, some of my friends were uh, sort of uh, nervous when they first uh, um, stood in front of the gilded panels and, and um, tried to do their tags with spray can. You know, they, they were kind of um, asking me, are you sure if I can <laughs> tag on this, you know? But, um, uh, you know, I, I, I would try to calm them down and just tell them, look, just do what it, whatever it is that you do on the streets and, and act like that this is just a wall that you would, you know, bomb on. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know if that calmed them down, but, you know, it worked. And it's surface. <laughs> yeah, it's just a surface. So it's just like an, any ordinary surface. Um, and yeah, the, mostly the big paintings are the ones that have uh, a collaboration with my friends. And um, some of the tiny ones um, have a different number of hands, but usually they're mostly tagged up by myself. And why, it's, um, why would it be, I mean, I imagine because it has to do with the expansion of the surface that you decide not to include so much tagging and bombing in the smaller surfaces. Some of your canvases are beautiful, but they're this tiny and they're so, they're like, they're so incredibly right. jewel-like. Um, you know, recently I've um, kind of been subduing the tagging. I don't know if it's due to me moving from Boyle Heights and um, my friends not used to coming to my house and my studio, but... Um, I also wanted to recently get um, the gold leaf to kind of, the gilded metal to shine a little bit more out of the background. And, you know, in the beginning when I, and the pieces that were at LACMA, I think were really bombed on. I remember like um, the piece Ride or Die, that had like, like, Five, six different hands involved in the in the tagging okay, aspect. Came to the opening, and I they remember. all came to the opening. <laughs> yes, I remember that. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, recently I think I've been kind of um, holding back on the tags a little bit so that the gold would gold and the metal would shine a little bit more. Would you say that it's a little bit of a change in direction in your work? I guess I can say it's an evolution, yeah. yeah. I've also been doing, um, kind of experimenting with, because back in 05, I think I was doing pieces that were more, um, that had more graffiti in it, and th there was a, a more intricate, sophisticated graffiti piece um, in the foreground, and I've been kind of doing away with that, and because um, that was that used to be the title of the painting, and um, now I would title the pieces in a simple chop block in the corner or whatever with old English letters, um, and that also is um, to kind of simplify what I'm doing, what I'm painting. Gajin, in terms of the subjects that you pick. Yeah. How how do you come about it? I mean, because they're they're all just different symbols in your work. I mean, we, if we look at the drawings here, which are incredible, mm -hmm. um, could you just explain to us a little bit uh, what what we're seeing depicted? Because it, it looks very traditional in some on a very superficial level. It looks almost traditional, but when you move beyond, there's a lot going on. Are we? Are you questioning about me about the drawings or um, just in general the the whole like paintings? And, yeah, you're in general. Um, well, you, yeah. Well, I guess the subject matter is there. They're all painted on the paintings. Um, you well, when I started, it was to 
to violate the people's expectations. So I started out with the um, the shunga or the erotic image imagery of the woodblock prints, and um, from there I've I've kind of been moving on to more um, auspicious themes and like this this one here um, to the right of me is um, uh, a, a golden boy and uh, also using subject matters that are from old folklore and myths as well from Japan um, which have always kind of intrigued me as a little kid um, hearing tales from my dad and from my mom, you know, from my parents. And they've always kind of, um, you know, been a, been a real question mark because I'd like to, you know, study more about my culture. Um, not being there in Japan, I, I feel like there's so much to, to learn from. Should we maybe move and see into the amazing film that you created about the process? <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. Um, so people can get a solid sense of how the drawings are made and Gajin put together this incredible film that... I, yeah. <laughs> I was only in it, but... <laughs> <laughs> but it's... Uh, the year 2000, 2001. When I came back from school, um, I was throwing away these stencils. Uh, they were a bit more crude uh, back in the days and I didn't think too much of them and my mom came up with like the genius idea of like just recycling them and she picked them out and thought maybe making collages out of them would be like a, a great drawing. And so that was the foundation in the beginning of the drawings. Yeah, okay, so she, her concept was that she felt that it was uh, a waste. Yeah. Just throw away. Just to throw away. So she um, really had the idea of recycling them and being ecological, I guess. <laughs> I always uh, uh, did graffiti with my brother, I think since uh, elementary school. So it was just a natural process for me to um, help out um, the pieces. And then uh, gold leafing was like the first process that um, I kind of got into. They've evolved, I think, and, and they've become very, uh, very complex and sophisticated. This is something that I'm working on, um, a text, uh, a name, an alias mm -hmm. for my friend. His uh, tag name is Jeffer.
the process of using the stencils is really deeply intertwined with the making of the paintings, but they've become their own thing now. And it's, uh, I remember when we worked together in 2005, they were, they were much, more, they, they, much more simpler. And I see here this incredible and super vibrant collages. So they, there's definitely an evolution. Right. Um, excuse me. Yeah, they. I think they have become um, a bit more intricate since '05 um, when you first saw them. Um, I think it was because of that show at LACMA that um, you know it made me aware that they are um, more than just something that. Uh, more than just a tool that I use. And so I've um, kind of, there, there's, be, there's been a preciousness that has um, arrived or arised through that show. And um, um, yeah, I, I've been aware of um, keeping these uh, stencils more intact and saving all the, little tiny pieces um, and it's become very sophisticated and complex and sometimes it's very hard when I'm working on like a real tiny piece that has a lot of um, different color separations it, it become like a puzzle and um, but yet there's you know because I work with just one sheet and the color separations are done on that one sheet you get the layers of all the different colors and you know you get a sense of abstraction as well because you see all these like triangular shapes on them which are um, old fishing weights from my dad when um, that I that I saved um, and I used them to kind of hold down the stencils um, on the ground or on the on the surface of the panels and um, you know, there are unintentional marks that, that come about, so people see a lot of abstraction from them and you know, a sense of, uh, of it being organic as well. I don't know if the audience has any questions for Gajin about the topics, the, the technique. <laughs> yeah. Finish my question. Um, that I not really, not really. But you know, I I, I was kind of um, uh, not afraid. But you know, when I first started, like with the, the erotic prints and stuff, I knew I would get you know people like just hating on me. You know. It, 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 I remember when I did my thesis show at the, in Vegas for my uh, graduation, uh, there were people, you know, calling it despicable and, you know, calling it not art. And, but, but from there, I, I knew I did something right, you know. Um, <laughs> there has to be some sort of hate, you know, in order for me to do something right, you know. I, I think I'll do, um, yeah, there's a few projects in the future that i be working with, like lithography, and I have done some lithography and silkscreen printing. Um, I don't know if I'll ever get to woodblock printing. Um, that's just like a whole nother game um, and a, a whole nother level of mastery, I think. I'm a big admirer of Yoshitoshi, and I can see that in your work. Uh, you want to? You have anything to? You want to elaborate about your your uh, your thoughts about him? Um, y Yoshitoshi, I I really love his subject matters, and um, 
his just intricacy of um, how he how he drew and his mastery of um, how he per perfected like the proportion of the human figure and stuff like that. Um, you know, when the woodblock prints started, uh, like in the 17th century, they were really crude and like the figures were really out of proportion and you know, you had characters with, or samurais with their eyes bulging out and stuff. And, but with, with Yoshitoshi, I think he refined and he was more in the um, end of the 19th century. So his, his stuff was a lot more refined and I liked the, the refined um, aspect of his prints as well. You know, he did a lot of um, gory subject matters and uh, a lot of uh, samurai genre prints as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, in terms of, you know, feeling a certain sense of wanting to maintain a connection with your community in Boyle Heights and how a sense of responsibility in terms of your work and the impact of those sorts of um, that sort of personal history in relationship to, um, you know, coming from a graffiti crew and how that functions. Like earlier you talked about kind of having, making graffiti more legitimate. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about that in terms of how it exists from your upbringing and then now kind of in a fine art context, if that makes sense? <laughs> Well, you know, I think graffiti is graffiti, and it's just going to keep evolving. Um, graffiti's become so universal. I think um, uh, the the show that Deitch had put on at MoCA, um, the art in the streets, had really um, kind of legitimized graffiti, so to speak, here in LA. Um, although, you know, um, I think I always pursue. Um, uh, to make graffiti be seen as something legitimate and um, you know people call it street art now and and uh, to me I think it'll always be graffiti um, I don't know it's just it's just something that I'll, I'll take to the grave with me um, and it's just uh, it's, it's just a part of part of me um, and I don't know if how I can how I can be responsible f you know um, maybe you know students and young people can see that uh, that they can they can do graffiti and it can become something bigger than what they're doing out in the streets you know Any other questions? You were saying there was uh, hatred against the painting, uh, the drawing, the sexual nature of them. But uh, am I wrong? Those people come from the Japanese community. Those came from outside. And because it's traditional, so that's what we Well, the, they're actually from traditional um, historical Japanese. Um, prints. Um, I don't know what you are referring to when you say Japanese community, like the Japanese American community. Are you asking me about? No, 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 no. They they didn't object. It was it was you know it was people in Vegas that were <laughs> <laughs> that were objecting to. Questions? <laughs> yeah. So um, when I see your stencils and you talked about the preciousness that developed this feeling of preciousness when you started paying attention and mounting them, and there is an element of where form and function meet, you know, when you look at the stencils, do they have they developed a different 
relationship with the final piece as well for you? I mean, do you have the same view on this as you do what comes of it? Or is it a sense of a step along the way? Or is it a completely separate work to you? Well, I think the paintings have also developed because the stencils have become more intricate and um, I'm paying attention to it, uh, paying attention to the stencils a lot more. Of course, the, the, the final um, result will, will uh, carry over with, with um, the, the paintings being much more intricate as well. Um, because the stencils are like the blueprints, um, uh, you know, th I think they, they'll keep evolving and becoming even more detailed and whatnot. Kajin, would you like at this juncture to maybe show some of your pictures? Right. Um, there's, there's... Oh. Yeah, I see in your paintings there's a lot of uh, your graffiti crews, K2S and STN, and I'm just wondering why KGB isn't represented. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, do you ever get tempted to, because stencils are sort of like a blueprint, do you ever get tempted to do more of one stencil? Yeah. You know, actually, David, um, the idea of stenciling kind of came from you as well. <laughs> When we, when we were at Fairfax, I remember when, when you had done some um, Bob Morley portraits and you stenciled them multiple times around the school and Melrose and, you know, the Hollywood area. Um, but um, I wish I could. I, and I, I have used, um, at times... Um, some stencils multiple times um, to, to kind of paint on t-shirts and stuff. Um, not the intricate ones, but the more simple text and stuff like that, yeah. Was it outrage the audience or violate, violate the audience? And you had mentioned something about the Golden Pavilion and the influence right. of that. Well, the, the Golden Pavilion is uh, something that uh, my parents had shown me and my brothers and the family when we visited, or when I first visited Japan in 87. And um, it's an old structure in Kyoto. Um, it was one of the uh, places, locations that um, General MacArthur had sanctioned to be left alone during the war because it was so beautiful. And, um, you know, years later when I was in grad school, I thought about the Golden Pavilion and I thought, wow. What if it, you know, it would be cool to if, I, if ever I got a chance to go bomb on the, <laughs> on the Golden Pavilion. <laughs> but, you know, I think I would be banished from Japan if I did that. And I'd like to go back to Japan. So, um, instead, I came up with my own gilded walls. And that was kind of the the first primary idea of having to tag on gold walls. Are you bound by that phrase now? <laughs> kind of, kind of. I mean, I can, I can, uh, I can appropriate it, I guess, you know, I, I'd have to give it some thought, but yeah, it's Dave's, you know, <laughs> phrase, so. Yeah, it seems to be in a way, if you did a painting that didn't violate expectations, how would you feel about, that? like something just came out that didn't have that, is that possible, or is that? Yeah, I think it's possible. I don't, I don't think all my pieces violate, you know, but <laughs> I hope they do, but, yeah. you know. 
but those are the, I think the the ones that do I think are the are the are the signature pieces. Well, one of the things that's always struck me about your paintings too is this archaeology of not only layers of paintings and materials, but cultures and your own social network. I mean, you have your friends participate in their in a level there, and then you have the wood blocks, and then you have the gold, and then you have the sort of flying helicopters from LA, and the, the sort of the, the ghetto birds. You know? I know. How how do you do you see it yourself as a layering, sort of like as an archaeology of your own? psyche, your own surroundings? I don't know. I mean, maybe one day an archaeologist can like dig through my paintings and <laughs> <laughs> find all these thin layers. I, I, I'm just joking, but um, you know, I, I, I wasn't quite aware of the, the levels of all these um, layers that I would be touching upon when I first came upon and across um, the first painting, but I kind of had an idea that um, these discussions would arise about, you know, East, West, uh, contemporary history, um, and just on and on. And I knew with all that involved in these paintings that um, they would be very attractive. And that's something that um, um, I felt immediately when I first like, did that painting motel. All right, so I don't know if there are any more questions or if we should move on to some of the amazing images that you brought for us? Well, yeah, there's just a couple of images. Okay. You know, the, 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 the piece behind the monitor you can't see, and this, this one was uh, originally in the, um, in the drawing show. I mean, not this painting, but the stencil to this painting. So I thought I'd show this to you. And yeah, it was one of the more colorful stencils, and I really liked it, so. I asked them to put it up. And this is um, the recent painting that I finished uh, at the end of last year. And it's probably like seven feet by 15 feet or something like that. And th it'll be shown at, in my um, solo show here in 2005, January. Um, Southland standoff. <laughs> 15. 2015, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, I guess, yeah, so that, that drawing um, is what is behind the monitor, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it's part of um, one of the main characters from the painting. Great. Well, this has uh, been an incredible pleasure, and uh, it's a real delight and opportunity to always sit down with you and see where, where your head is and where your work is. <laughs> and uh, we, I think all in, everybody in the audience is really thankful for the opportunity, so... Well, thank you, everybody, for coming out. <laughs>